Out of all the stories and news items I've covered related to transgenderism, one in particular stands out in terms of its crushing effect on a person's life and how far-reaching and entrenched gender ideology has become in the family courts, the legal system, and in medical institutions, all three of which, in this case, intersected in a nightmarish fashion. Many journalists and others who write about these issues sometimes refer to gender ideology as a multi-headed hydra, and few know that reality better than Ted Hudako. A family court judge removed this San Francisco Bay Area father's custody of his teenage trans-identifying child. In violation of court orders, but with the encouragement of his ex-wife, doctors at the University of California San Francisco healthcare system surgically implanted a hormone-blocking device in his minor son's arm and also started him on a course of cross-sex hormones. Hudako's story first gained widespread attention when journalist Abigail Schreier documented his harrowing ordeal in the Manhattan Institute's publication City Journal in February of 2022. Her meticulous investigation detailed how ideologically captured court officers severed Hudako's parental rights and steered his trans-identifying child down the path of so-called gender-affirming care. Hudako's son, who we'll call Drew to protect his identity, is almost certainly sterilized now given the length of time he has been taking these experimental drugs. I and other investigative reporters have since documented other aspects of this father's case and his resolute efforts to keep resisting. And this is no small feat given the cultural climate and vast legal infrastructure in place in the state of California, which is now known as a trans sanctuary. Because of how his story encapsulates many themes we have discussed in season three of this podcast series, we are honored to speak with Ted Hudako and his attorney, Tracy Henderson, about his ongoing battles and what's at stake for other families in this bonus episode of Generation Indoctrination. So Ted, you're in the middle of what I would call the Amazon jungle of gender ideology out there in the Bay Area of California, but before we dive too deeply into the legal actions you've been taking, how did you first learn that your son was quote-unquote trans, and how did it all unfold on the medical side of things? What all happened there, and how quickly did it happen? I'm a dad who had a 20-year marriage with two sons. Shortly after our older son turned 15, his mother came to me and told me that he was trans, and she immediately separated from our marriage, and she took both my older son and our younger son the younger son came back home a couple days later on his own. The mom and I had some conversations, and she indicated an early interest in pursuing transition at University of California, San Francisco, Child and Adolescent Gender Center. I had many questions, naturally, since the uh, gender incongruence uh, appeared spontaneously. And this was in a boy I had raised 15 years with him daily. I began researching what might be going on. The mother filed for divorce about four months later, about seven months after that, uh, we had our first family court hearing uh, before California Judge Joni Hiramoto. I retained shared custody of the younger child, but of the older son, I lost all visitation, all physical custody, lost participation in medical appointments, therapy appointments, notification of such. Basically everything with the sole exception that any gender identity related surgery would require my written consent, or the mother would have to seek a separate court order in the event that I refuse consent. Otherwise, UCSF was put in the driver's seat to make medical recommendations, which my ex-wife could accept and follow. No other providers, no med other medical providers or therapists were allowed, including the ones that I had suggested to the court, be uh, allowed to do the evaluation and treatment of my son. This all seemed rather strange to Hudako. As he researched more, he would subsequently learn that the doctor who treated his son, Stephen Rosenthal, is the co-founder and medical director for the University of California, San Francisco, Benioff Children's Hospital's Child and Adolescent Gender Center. Rosenthal is also the former president of the Pediatric Endocrine Society. He has, according to multiple reports, received thousands of dollars from a number of pharmaceutical companies that produce puberty blockers, and was also among the gender clinicians who were the recipients of federal research grants from the National Institutes of Health supporting experimental studies on gender-confused children. But before becoming aware of just how deeply embedded this ideology was within the medical system, Hudako wondered, wouldn't it be prudent to consider a second opinion on this, especially for something so fraught and high stakes? 
During the custody hearings, he tried multiple times to introduce scientific medical evidence and expert witnesses, but Judge Joni Hiramoto wouldn't consider any of them. Fifteen months following the custody orders that contained the no gender identity surgery injunction, he was shocked to discover an unspecified charge for $209,820.34 on his health insurance statement. All he knew were the basics, the name of the doctor, the date of the service, and that it had taken place two and a half months earlier at UCSF's gender center. I emailed to my ex-wife and her attorney at multiple times asked what would account for a $209,000 charge. My ex-wife reticently replied that a procedure, and she used that word, a procedure, for a suprelin implant had taken place, and she indicated she had intentionally withheld this information from me. At the time, I did not know what suprelin was. Basically, it's a puberty blocker that is implanted subdurally under the skin. Again, I continued to try to find information. I consulted with two doctors, an endocrinologist, as well as a clinical psychologist who had just recently retired from UCSF's gender clinic. And both of these doctors told me, Ted, that is really serious. That's really bad. You need to get that removed because uh, your son's going to be permanently sterilized in four months because in addition to the suprelin, the mother had started my son on estrogen and the two of those in combination will cause sterility. That's sort of the nutshell. I did try to get that implant removed was unsuccessful in that. There were a number of averse legal actions taken against me, and basically the window came for my son to get sterilized, passed. And he, many months later, aged out, became 18, and now is an adult. And that's sort of where, where things stand. I came to learn quite a bit more about what had happened in my son's medical treatment after the fact, and learned quite a bit more about which Judge Hiramoto and the entire family court system is up to with respect to why they had this preconceived agenda in place to put my son through transition. And we've also discovered evidence of planning and collusion between the family court and UCSF. Lawyer Tracy Henderson, formerly a finance law attorney in New York and lead defense counsel against Lehman Brothers, first met Hudako at a protest in the Palo Alto area of California, sponsored by Our Duty USA, a nonprofit group that seeks to protect children from gender ideology. Following the protest, Ted shared his story with Tracy, and it was the first time she had encountered a parent enduring this particular nightmare in the family courts. Approximately a year and a half later, she had hired a federal paralegal because a lot of her cases were turning into federal court cases. The paralegal just so happened to bring Ted's case to her attention. At first, she didn't remember him, but as the shocking facts were recounted, the memory resurfaced. She wound up switching her entire law practice to fight for children and families caught in this maw. Hudako is presently taking action both in the family court to hold the people who facilitated the chemical sterilization of his son in contempt and a federal suit. I asked Tracy to explain the crux of both legal actions particularly in light of their claim that the UCSF Medical Center violated the court order. So a family law case is typically about divorce, child custody. What's happening in that particular case, and I'm involved on a limited basis, is Mr. Hudako has filed for contempt. So when you violate a court order, you vindicate the authority of the court by filing for contempt, which means they could be fined or sent to jail. And it's a really simple situation. The judge said no gender identity surgery until the child is 18, or if both parents agree, or if there's a court order. And instead of following that order, the minor's counsel, the mom's counsel, the UCSF counsel, all of them went behind Ted's back and they had a 200000 like you heard from him, $209,000 surgery done on the minor son. And just before they did that, the mom had the son deposit sperm into a sperm bank because she knew he was going to be sterilized. So Ted is seeking to vindicate the authority of the court and have the court hold him in contempt. And because in family court, you don't get monetary remedies, you can't get punitive damages, you can't get emotional distress damages. Ted filed in federal court. 
It's really different. It's really about the deprivation of his fundamental right under the 14th Amendment, under the Constitution, to direct the minor child's medical care. And they violated that. And he suffered emotional distress. I mean, I can't imagine being a man who has had a son whose mother of the son is trying to change the boy into a girl or allowing the change of a boy into a girl of a child. So I can't speak to our conversations because they're attorney client privilege, but just put yourself in this man's shoes. What could he be feeling? So he's seeking emotional distress, intentional infliction of emotional distress. And I, to me, those are the major causes of action. The other one is conspiracy. And to me, I rarely get cases that are not complicated, right? This is not complicated. There is documentation from the physicians, okay? Progress notes. We all know what doctor's progress notes are. That establishes that these people got together and went behind Ted's back to implant puberty blockers in this child. And that's a conspiracy. That's an act of fraudulent concealment. And I will just say for people who don't understand what I just said, right, because it's legal jargon, what the most powerful part of it is, is that Ted's parental rights, right, custody, care were taken away by the family court. And this judge, as you heard, took them away because he wouldn't affirm or participate in this fad, this attempt to create a social norm of that affirmation of a child is correct. So this judge took his parental rights away, but she did save one right, that he can't undergo gender identity surgery until the child is 18 or both parents agree. She saved that right for him. And these attorneys who are officers of the court, who know what a court order is, know what a court order means, conspired to go behind his back and violate a court order. Now, I can say that based on the progress notes, and I can say that with certainty because as an officer of the court, if Christine Hudaka was my client and I had the same order as her lawyer, and she tried to talk to me about having the opposition client's son do surgery in violation of the court order, I would have an affirmative duty to say to my client, no, we are going into court to ask the judge to change the order. That was not done, so I can't guarantee anything, but the evidence really shows that they all conspired to do this to Ted behind his back. Parents navigating the tangled web of gender ideology when the family courts are involved often find themselves calculating what they say and how they say it, given the depth of the ideological capture in the judicial system. At the initial custody hearing, Judge Joni Hiramoto actually asked him, quote, if your son were medically psychotic and believed himself to be the Queen of England, would you love him? Unquote. Hudako interpreted that bewildering question as a sly insinuation that if his child was truly trans, he wouldn't love him. Hudako could not believe he was being asked such a thing because his son is objectively not the Queen of England and never will be. He had to hedge and calculate his responses strategically to not set off the proverbial tripwire he detected that was operating in the courtroom. But no matter how many thoughtful caveats and even-handed qualifications he attempted, he would later learn that the fix was in from the start. I went into this thinking that the situation would be evaluated rationally. I didn't have resistance to gender transition based on a radical fundamentalist set of beliefs. That seemed to be, I guess, a motivation that was attributed to me by a Judge Hiramoto, as if there could be no other reason one would have questions about transition. I was actually concerned by some initial interactions I had with staff at UCSF about their lack of what I considered to be proper evaluation and sort of rush to judgment and one-size-fits-all treatment. And that's really where I was coming from. I was, uh, I had actually engaged with Kenneth Zucker, who led the committee to find gender identity disorder for the dsm 4 as well as the gender dysphoria definition for, for the dsm 5 and his most published researcher in the area. I also had asked the court for a neuropsychological evaluation, full workup, to find out what might be going on with our son. Those seemed like things that any parent 
in any court would actually welcome. So it was odd that instead I was confronted with Hiramoto famously posed the Queen of England hypothetical. And exactly how that went down, Judge Hiramoto asked me, if your son were medically psychotic and believed himself to be the Queen of England, would you love him? And my first answer was, well, of course I would. I'd also try to get him help. And to that, Judge Hiramoto replied, I understand that qualifier, but if it were, if you were told by your son's psychiatrist or psychologist that Drew were very fragile and that confronting him, or I'm sorry, confronting them with the idea that they are not the Queen of England is very harmful to their mental health, could you go along and say, okay, Drew, you are the Queen of England and I love you. You are my child and I want you to do great and please continue to see your psychologist. Could you do that? And I thought that was a weird question and I thought about it for a second and I said, yes, that sounds like part of a process that might take some time, sure. And Judge Hermo became angry at that point and she asked, what process? What is this thing that might take some time accepting the idea that Drew occupies an identity that you believe is not true? And I was stunned, frankly. I said to her, Your Honor, the identity you just mentioned to me was the Queen of England. Now I can tell him and I can affirm to him to reassure him situationally, but objectively, he's not the Queen of England and that won't change. And even the therapist in that case would know that. <laughs> and Judge Hiramoto became silent. She looked down um, and she knew she had messed up. Um, I, I didn't mean to make her look like an idiot, but it was an idiotic thing to say. That really sort of set the tone. Then she actually, elsewhere in that hearing, effect, effectively accused me of, of having fundamentalist religious beliefs, which I didn't really quite understand where she was coming from, because that's nothing I ever put out there. The manipulation didn't stop there. As Abigail Schreier noted in her City Journal investigation of his case, Hiramoto appointed Daniel Harkins to be the minor's counsel for his son a move which turned out to be, quote, the final nail in the coffin of his parental rights, unquote. Hiramoto decisively used Harkin's recommendations to remove Ted's custody, eliminating him from having any say over what was done medically to his son. Since he started contesting this in the courts, the opposition has tried to explain away the gender identity surgery contention with semantics games, arguing that the insertion of the suprelin hormone blocker that was performed on Drew was a simple procedure, that it wasn't a drastic gender reassignment surgery, such as a vaginoplasty or an orchiectomy, and that, therefore, no violation of the court order occurred. Well, there's multiple games that are being played. Some cases, they attempt, the defendants, the CITES, attempt to claim that only a procedure was performed, not a surgery. Or they attempt to claim that I'm making this up and calling it a surgery when, no, I'm not making this up. I'm referring directly to a bill that the doctor produced stating surgery in all capital letters. We can also reference the Suprelin LA prescribing information, which is an FDA-issued document, and it states directly Suprelin LA is a surgical procedure. There's a description of the surgery pack containing a scalpel. There's an incision that's made, there's sutures, there's antiseptic to keep the wound clean after the surgery. And we know from the Business and Professions Code of California, I can't recall the, the, the statute number, but surgery is defined as any infiltration or cutting of flesh. And that's exactly what happened. Procedure would be something different. If they gave him a suppository, for instance, or cleaned his teeth, that would have been a procedure. This was a surgery. Another thing we see in particular by the Miners Council in one of his, I believe it's um, Demur, he twists the words, not even twists, he completely changes the words from Judge Hiramoto's order, which the order states the child shall not be permitted to undergo any gender identity related surgery. Miners Council Harkin changes that to gender reassignment surgery, and that's not what the judge stated or wrote. So I don't know what exactly they think they're going to pull. Part of it is that they've brought, I believe, a total of nine demurs and motions to dismiss and motions to strike against us. They're trying to cut us, you know, with a thousand paper cuts and overwhelm us in paper. 
it's Tracy and, and her paralegal, the two of them are basically contesting with a total, I think, 25 attorneys and paralegals on the other side combined. In fact, surgery is statutorily defined in California as any act in which human tissue is cut, altered, or otherwise infiltrated by any means. Any layman, as Tracy explains, can read the text of the law and understand the plain meaning of these words. She believes that the other side is now trying to obfuscate the meaning because they know they're wrong. We've got the surgeon's bill, where he calls it a surgery. It's implanted in your arm. So for them to play these games and make these arguments strains all credibility in the court. It's a surgery. But it's really telling. When you don't have the law or the facts on your side, you gaslight, you make things up. And that's what they're doing. So our challenge, though, in this case is that we need a fair trier of fact in both areas, in federal and family court. And that's becoming more and more increasingly difficult, especially in the Contra Costa County area. But even when the facts are on your side that a violation has been committed, what can be done when the arbiters of justice in the courts are rigidly beholden to a set of beliefs that prioritizes a person's self-declared sense of their identity over and above everything else? Is there any hope for parents who express caution about medicalizing their children's psychological troubles in this way, especially when there is a dispute between the parents in a messy divorce? The layers of ideological capture run deep in Contra Costa County because not only was Judge Hiramoto willing to display her ideological predilections during court proceedings, when she was transferred to a different division, the new jurist assigned to Hidako's case, Judge Benjamin Reyes II, began another hearing by announcing his pronouns. And it's more than just the judges. It's also those training them through continuing legal education courses. A key figure who facilitated the sterilization of Hudako's son was Asaf Orr, an attorney whose name appeared in the medical progress notes. At the time, he was the UCSF Gender Clinic's lead counsel. Hudako's case was even used as an example in one such continuing legal education course about how judges should deal with a parent who expresses caution about allowing their children to be medicalized. My first encounter with the name Asaf Orr was in the medical progress note of my son, written by uh, medical director Stephen Rosenthal, in which Asaf Orr, Mac's wife's attorney, as well as the minor's counsel, so, so three attorneys are mentioned, they're discussed as having navigating around a complex family situation in which father, me, uh, is not supportive of gender care. They also discuss their intention to use my insurance and, and, again, to navigate around me and keep it quiet. I found it weird at the time. Why are there lawyers mentioned in a medical progress note? Shouldn't this be about the health of my son? But regardless... It came to my attention about a year after discovering the surgery that my judge, Judge Hiramoto, the Queen of England hypothetical judge, taught a class, co-presented a class with this Asaf Orr at the Contra Costa Bar Association. I believe the title of the class was Transgender and Gender Issues in Custody. It's an hour-long presentation, I believe. Uh, it's a continuing legal education course for attorneys, for aspiring minors counsels, a required type of class uh, if you want to do that line of work. It's a remarkable class insofar that it's full of falsehoods and, and misinformation, which I believe is intentionally promulgated, such as puberty blockers are harmless, cause no side effects, and are reversible, 100% reversible. Another thing that's interesting about that class is they present artifacts from my case as part of the class handouts to the students. Specifically, the report produced by Miners Counsel Dan Harkins and Judge Hermode holds it up as an example of a great job by the Miners Counsel debunking the efforts to present the science by the parent in opposition. Very Orwellian term if you've ever heard of it. They call parents like me who have questions the parent in opposition. Why not call me the protective parent, for instance? But the other thing that's very apparent from this class is that my case and other cases like mine are prejudged by the by the judge, which just explains the experience I had in Judge Hiramoto's court. She didn't care about anything I presented. She already had to decide. She had orders written before I walked into that courtroom. She knew what she was going to do. I mean, that was to fast track 
my child put him onto the conveyor belt at UCSF for a $209,000 procedure. And everybody involved in my case made money in one way or another. Harkins has been appointed as minor's counsel, according to his own bio, dozens of times. It's entirely likely that every family court judge in Contra Costa County has appointed him. And it's hard enough for a man like Ted, who is not an attorney, to be subjected to this kind of systemic capture. I asked Tracy, what's it like for a trained lawyer? We went to court on the 2nd in the family law case. What was supposed to happen in court is they're supposed to be arraigned. So contempt is a quasi-criminal because the remedies or the penalties are potentially jail. So we were supposed to be arraigned and... All of these CITES, which is Harkins, the mom, the mom's counsel, and I think that's it. They were supposed to be arraigned. Instead, they had filed attacks. They had filed what should have been called a motion, motions to discharge. They wanted to kill that. So we're there, and some of them were untimely filed, so we had to deal with what we're gonna, how we're going to handle that. And it, it's typical that it would get continued. So during that simple exchange, right? How do you want to handle this? There's violations of a, of a code. Do you want to move it? Do you want to argue? What do you want to do? There was an exchange between the judge and I, and he began the whole entire proceeding with his pronouns. Now, there's a federal court case called Mirabella v. Olson, which this judge gets it. It's where two teachers in Escondido sued because they were forced to lie to parents about kids who were trying to go through the transitioning period. And the judge lays it out. The fact is, is that use of pronouns, all of those preliminary steps prior to medicalization are, are the process of social transitioning. So you're, you're a judge, you're sitting up there and you use your pronouns, you're already on the other side. Because here's the problem in our society is boys cannot become girls and girls cannot become boys. This is a controlled worldwide transhumanism movement that is being pushed on people and they're trying to create social norms and it's permeated our judicial system now. When I apply for the bar license to be renewed or anything, I they ask me for my pronouns and I say, I don't participate in that. So I'm a human that's normal. There's only two genders. I, I don't mean to be mean to people, but the science is clear. There's only two sexes. And so he participates in that and I have no option but to call him on it. So I respectfully asked him to consider whether he could be fair. And previous to going on the record, he called me Mr. Henderson. Ted and I heard it. I still believe in the law. <laughs> so I wasn't sure I heard it, but I heard it. I said, okay, here we go. It convinced me that I'm going to raise this, this case. So I raised the case and during the conversation, he believed he could be fair, he said, which we don't agree with him. And then he, I thought I heard him say Mr. Henderson again, this time on the record. And I said, Your Honor, just to be clear, I'm Mrs. Henderson. He said, oh, thank you for identifying yourself. Mrs. Henderson. I said, Your Honor, I'm not identifying myself. That's my name. And what was really fascinating to me was there was observers who conducted an informal focus group on what they saw. And from their perspective, he was biased. And this is in our justice system now. So we are definitely going to file a challenge and disqualification request, but it shouldn't be there. It sh we shouldn't have to be dealing with this. The surgical procedure that was performed on Ted's son in violation of the court order and the ideological capture of the courts are truly horrifying developments. And as we explore this issue, there's another layer we must dig deeper into, and that is the other risks of transgender medicalization. Many Americans are understandably alarmed that if a child on this pathway is given a combination of puberty-blocking drugs and cross-sex hormones, he or she will almost certainly be rendered permanently sterile. But an under-discussed impact of hormone blockers in children is a sort of freezing effect of the drug on the child's developing brain. As Dr. Sally Baxendale, a British neuropsychologist noted in a February 2024 essay in the publication Unheard, of the 16 studies that have specifically examined the impact of puberty blockers on cognitive function, 11 were conducted in animals. Most of those studies found some detrimental effects on cognitive function when the researchers gave these drugs to mice, sheep, or monkeys. 
Only one study out of the five that were done on blockers used in children was, in Baxendale's opinion, well-designed. As she has explained, in that study, the researchers measured IQ in the children before administering the blockers and then closely observed the impact of the drugs over 28 months on a comprehensive battery of cognitive tasks. The findings suggested an overall drop in IQ of 10 points and a notable decline in verbal comprehension. Baxendale has struggled to be published in peer-reviewed academic journals, noting that in all her years of research, she never encountered the kinds of concerns that some of the reviewers expressed in response to an article she wrote reviewing the literature on blockers. At issue wasn't Baxendale's methods, it was her findings that did not jive with the narrative that these blockers are supposedly safe and reversible. In an October presentation at the Society for Evidence-Based Gender Medicine, Baxendale explained how blockers, in essence, freeze the brain and impair cognition, and that no one really knows whether the drugs are, as trans activists like to claim, completely safe and reversible. How has this been allowed to develop as a treatment when we know so much about brain development and stopping puberty and what happens in puberty? And we can kind of predict that cognition is going to be really, really important. How has nobody been looking at this? All of the thousands of patients that have gone through this treatment, it's, I think it's a medical scandal. That's my particular point of view. Puberty is a sensitive window of neurodevelopment associated with significant cognitive changes in brain function and structure. Animal studies indicate that the suppression of puberty impacts brain structure and the development of social and cognitive functions in mammals. The effects are quite complex, they're sex-specific. There's no evidence that cognitive effects are fully reversible. Um, No human studies have systematically explored these treatments on neuropsychological function with an adequate sample size baseline or follow-up. There's some evidence of a detrimental impact um, in, in the very, very poorly controlled and very, very few studies that are out there. And really very critical questions remain unanswered about the nature, the extent, the permanence of any arrested development of cognitive function that may be associated with these treatments. How can we say that these things are reversible when nobody has bothered to look and it is an outrage that nobody has bothered to look given what we know about brain development? Such is the horror Ted was trying to protect his son from the sort of terror Tracy is also trying to use the legal system to thwart. So Tracy, what if you win? If you prevail in court, what will this do for Ted? And what precedent will this set for other families? Let's say you meet someone in Alabama who says, oh, this is just crazy wild California, this won't affect me. What would you say to them? Well, federal law can be used across the nation, typically, for precedent. What he's going for in the federal case is monetary remuneration, we say. So it's money. He's going to be made whole. I know, Ted, he's not doing this for the money. It's That's just the remedy that the law provides in the federal case. You get an injunction, which is to make somebody do something or stop doing something. It's too late. His son's already been implanted with life-changing puberty blockers. I would suspect he uses it for the good of the rest of society and for his son. Suprilin freezes you emotionally and mentally at the age when you take it. I mean, how does a mother do that? This case will help bring awareness to people who are potentially considering it. I cannot wrap my head around a mother doing that to a child. So I don't understand how you get through that because we're supposed to protect. And this is not protection what this mother is doing. I don't understand it. But It's going to have bigger implications because it's in federal court. And I think Ted did that purpose. Now, in the family law case, it's an accountability. I would say that if Daniel Harkins, because we spoke about him and how often he's appointed and favored by the court, I would say if he's found in contempt for this, that is something that could potentially be taken up to the state bar and there could be real ramifications for that because you put it all of the facts together that he's appointed so much, he's done this, he's now been held in contempt. We need to pray. We need to pray over this family. We need to pray over Ted. We really do because we are up against the evil in this situation has permeated our justice system. How do we get a fair anything if this is permeated so deeply that the judges are acting like this? in violation of the judicial canon of ethics. Do we even have a fair justice system in California anymore? 
I don't know. So please, if you are inclined, please pray over Ted because it has greater implications than just him and just money. Ted Hudako believes that there are sure to be more cases like his unless this can somehow be brought to a halt. These rogue family court judges willing to facilitate such medicalization against the wishes of parents are going to have to be reined in and get the message that this is unacceptable jurisprudence. I asked him what he thinks is coming on the horizon if these judges and other officers of the court continue to go unchecked. If we don't stop this, this is going to continue and accelerate. And there is so much money on the table and there are so many unethical players involved that they will try to, in my belief, uh, sweep in more families, more kids uh, to monetize them, make them lifelong medical patients. Um, I'll also add, I've met a number of detransitioners. Now, I haven't met a detransitioner who has had the same course of puberty blockers as my son. Fortunately for them, but the detransitioners I've met all have had negative health consequences, some extraordinarily horrific. And I, I don't need to tell you, Brandon, about that. But some of these detransitioners are so wrecked that I cannot imagine that they would have the wherewithal to pull off a legal effort, which given how difficult and, and how hard the defendants in the UCSF, the hospital, um, are fighting me. I, I just can't imagine how a detransitioner could get justice. So somebody's got to step up and try to do this. I happen to have standing to do this. And like I said, this is going to happen to other families on an increasing basis. Now, the defendants, the CITES, the clinics that are doing this, the family courts, the lawyers that are doing this, I do have to give them credit that they're way competent, they're ill-intented, they're competent, and they learn. I don't think other families down the pike are going to get custody orders worded like mine was, and they wouldn't have the ability, this, the, the gap in standing that I have to go after them. So if I don't do this, the opportunity may be lost. And fortunately for my knowing uh, the paralegal that Tracy mentioned, I was able to get both these actions filed just before the expiry of limitations. Hudako's case against the University of California's gender clinic is ongoing, and he's crowdfunding to raise support for his legal fees that are mounting at givesendgo.com slash stop gender experiments on kid. In early February, his case was continued until March 29th. Tracy believes that TEDs will not be the only case and that parents must do everything they can to shield their children from the gender industry. Indeed, they must not participate in any of it at all, especially when interfacing with the courts, where ideological claims of trans activists are effectively the law of the land, if not already in actual statutes. How, as a parent who sees through what's going on with this gender identity dysphoria situation we find ourselves in. How do you find protection if not in the law? It's bigger than just the judicial system. It's the legislature. There's an active effort to try to make gender affirmation a positive social norm. In the family court system, when you're looking at a custody situation, it's a factor analysis. You kind of like the weights of the scales of justice. You've got five factors. They tried to add one that said the gender, if you don't affirm a questioning gender, then that could be weighed against you as a parent. That's a false social norm because it's bad to affirm gender. What you need to do is get a child a therapist because something else is going on there. And our society is attacking our most vulnerable children. They're going after autistic kids. They're going after latchkey kids. They're going after abused kids because they have lower self-esteem. They're having a harder time figuring out who they are. We all go through it in, you know, as a young child in middle school, but they're going after those most vulnerable. And it's it's a movement. It, it's ASOF or it's UCSF. It's about money. And, it's, and for a lot of really perverted people, it's about a, a whole new sexual movement. So you want to fight that as a parent, knowing what's right, knowing your job is to protect your child, get them into therapy. And now what you have to do to protect them is not go to a judge. It's to pick them up and take them out of the country for two months and get them away from the school system, get them away from Everybody around them who believes this is okay. Oh, but wait, you might risk kidnapping if you've got an adverse 
person on the other side, an allegation of kidnapping. Or you take him to another state where they will they will not recognize the jurisdiction of California. And it's just, it's, it's complete insanity. We're, how can you not see by stepping back and looking at the big picture what it's doing to families? Divorce is already hard enough. My recommendation is stay away from CPS. Stay away from the judicial system on these issues if you can. Because it's there's no help out there when it comes to the judicial system right now in California. We're in we're in a lot of trouble. And the only way out of it is to not participate. You have to be you cannot use the language. You you boys cannot become girls. Girls cannot become boys. I don't care what anybody says. You need a therapist if you think so. And if you're a parent that believes that, you need help. And that's it. And you just really cannot participate. I mean, Ted's much more articulate in this space than I am, but from a most basic level, you just cannot participate in this. Thank you for listening to this bonus episode of the third season of Generation Indoctrination. To find out more about what parents in California are doing to protect children from transgender medicalization and surgery, check out protectkidsca.com. If you're so moved to support Ted Hudako in his ongoing fight, you may do so at givesendgo.com slash stop gender experiments on kids.